Air Group commanders were fine people with exceptional capabilities. No one doubted it. With a simple push of a button, they could get hundreds of airplanes in the air and send them out to carry out their orders. If there had been a good night's drinking, and they felt a little out of sorts in the morning, any one of them could order thousands of young pilots in blue uniforms to line up, and everyone would be standing at attention, waiting for who knows what. Even if it's just an inspection, they can send a man from John O'Groats to Baghdad. But when it comes to cancelling an appointment, things turn out very differently. Ah, I need to think it over, one declares. I don't have time for that right now, says another. And the end result is almost always the same. Nothing happens. Such was the case in my case. Traveling to Fighter Command Headquarters brought no joy. A short visit to Grantham, where the 5th Air Group Headquarters was located, was a waste of time. I had to go to the training squadron after all. Bob and I remembered the last week of the squadron only for the frantic tossing from side to side, when we had to do a thousand things at once, and for the grand farewell parties. I was sorry to leave the fighter squadron, and part with the guys. Someone even brought up the idea that it wouldn't be a bad idea for me to take over the squadron again when I got back after six months in the training unit. Ted was feeling far from his best, and at the time he needed a vacation himself. But I wasn't going back. Flying night fighters is fun, but it requires a lot of patience, which I didn't have. I thought I'd rather be in a single-engine fighter, especially if you're lucky enough to be hunting. It would have been nice to be in a hurricane attack plane. Hunting for trains is both safe and interesting. Night fighters, however, are something else. Over the course of a year, I flew about 70 night sorties and 30 day sorties. And during that time, I saw about 20 crots, of which I managed to fire on only nine. Apparently, I didn't make a sniper. I was a born bomber. A lot of people asked me, who do I like better? fighters or bombers? The answer is obvious. They also often ask me, what is the difference between the two? I may be wrong, but it seems to me that the difference is in the characters and mentality. First of all, a distinction should be made between day fighters and night fighters. The former are pilots of single-engine airplanes. This pilot is not responsible for anything but his own skin. Well, and for his comrades in joint actions during air combat. He doesn't need long, tedious training. He leads a happy, carefree life. Flying is a source of pleasure for him, although losses in fighter units are quite high. A night fighter crew is a group of highly trained specialists who must work as a unit. Guys on Spitfires avoid going into clouds, as in this case, you will have to pilot by instruments. Boo fighters fly exclusively on instruments, sometimes from the moment they take off until they land. Most of their time is spent on exercises, day and night. They have a lot of hard work to do, but more often than not, they have to exercise a hell of a lot of patience. For these reasons, night fighters are very often flown by former instructors with a formidable amount of experience. Often these are not young family men who want to serve their country and really do a lot for it. But when it comes to the level of losses from enemy action, night fighter units are the safest place to be. But on the other hand, they always have to fight an internal enemy, the weather. Almost everyone agrees that night fighters fly in much worse weather than any other pilots. But if the pilot is confident in his blind flying skills, it's not too dangerous. The level of danger was, of course, different depending on where the squadron was based. Some squadrons could not see the sea at all, while those based, for example, in West Maling, spent most of the time over the enemy coast. It must be said that we preferred not to take rubber boats in our airplanes, so in case of trouble we had a long swim home. But even with all this in mind, during the whole year that I spent in the 29th Squadron, we lost only one man from enemy action. That was a gunner radio operator who flew with Charles Widows. During a Ju-88 attack they sped past, and the German gunner put a long line into our plane. Everything happened at once. One engine quit, radio equipment failed, Charles was wounded, and the observer jumped out with a parachute. Unfortunately, they were 50 miles from shore. 
Charles showed marvels of skill when he managed to bring the downed plane to base in total darkness without any instruments. Until just before landing, he did not realize that his gunner had jumped out. But the bad weather took a few casualties. Alan Grout, Robin Miles, Sheet, Freer and someone else were the unlucky ones. Most of them are buried on the hillside near West Mowling. Yes, the main enemy of the night fighters turned out to be the weather, not the Germans. You had to learn to fly well if you were going to stay alive. Now let's talk about bomber pilots. Here a man had a serious responsibility. First of all, his crew consisted of seven people. They flew planes that weighed about 30 tons and cost 35,000 pounds. They had to combine the art of a night fighter and the courage of a day fighter. They constantly faced the dangers of bad weather, icing, low clouds. They had to overcome the oppressive effects of high losses from enemy action. They had to wait weeks before it was known what had happened to their comrades. And all the while they had to carry their burden of responsibility for themselves and others. This is probably why bomber pilots behave somewhat more quietly than others. They tend to stand in the corner of the bar, smoke a pipe or cigarette, and keep quiet. However, I've also known guys of a different character. We will never let our work overpower us, they used to say. And yet, they did not go around dressed like movie stars, because the very nature of their work required iron discipline and high morale. A good commander can instill the latter, but the former has to be hammered in by force. Many pilots, arriving in the bomber squadron, thinking only about flying and life seems to them a lot of fun. However, this is not the case. Very quickly they discover that the other pilots behave like real captains of small airships who carefully monitor the outside of the business. All the rooms are thoroughly cleaned, the gardens are groomed and trimmed, and the airplanes sparkle with polished plating. This approach to service is paying off, people are performing much better. That, I think, is the difference between the two. Some will wonder why. When talking about pilots, I focus so much on parties and beer. The reason is simple and straightforward. These guys live, eat, sleep and face death all together. Some get lucky and complete their operational cycle safely. Others don't. If someone sneaks out in the evening with a girl, for example, to the movies, he will not recognize the squadron and the squadron will not recognize him. If young people make mistakes at night, the squadron's morale will die. The only way to get close to these guys is to go out and get drunk together, get it into their heads that they're the best. Make them forget the drill of yes, sir, no, sir. But at the same time, you should be prepared to keep this atmosphere the next day. Be polite and be able to listen to advice. Specialists in the squadron usually know more than the commander. Only in this way you will be able to maintain high morale and a sense of elbow. Crots should be shot down and put bombs directly into the target. Having gone from an ordinary pilot to a squadron commander, I was convinced that this method is absolutely correct. I have served under a variety of commanders, quiet and noisy, soft and hard. But only one, Ted Colbeck Welch, knew how to handle people. Although I did not excel as a night fighter pilot, I was able to learn many useful things from him. He showed me how to keep the mood in the squadron normal. And that was characteristic of fighter command. It was a community of happy people. And now I was forced to go to a training squadron. I felt just disgusting. The weather had been completely unflyable for the last week, so the farewell parties for Dave, Bob, and me had been great. The last one came at the end of the year, when the entire base personnel, along with their friends and wives, were gathered in the big hall for Christmas. It was the grandest party ever. Faces were smeared with burnt cork and lipstick. Everyone was tripped up without distinction of rank or position. If anyone looked at it from the outside, they would be amazed at our behavior. But we just needed to blow off the steam that had built up over a long period of time because of the inaction of the crots. I ran away before the end of the party. I hope you can see why. The next day, the guys spent an hour trying to wash my face. Toward the end of the party, my wife drew two big question marks on my cheeks with lipstick. It looked pretty funny at the time, 
but the next day I couldn't get them off. We even tried gasoline in vain. So I had to report to Colonel Fullergood on arrival at my new duty station with a scratched face and two red stripes on my cheeks. However, it was New Year's Day, and I think he attributed it to bad liquor. At any rate, he didn't say a word. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The days in the training squadron slowly added up to weeks. I couldn't say I was happy, but Fullergood was the perfect commander in a situation like this, and life didn't seem so bad. But the news did. We started the year full of hope. The Russians launched a counteroffensive at Kharkov. At the same time, General Okinlik, advancing in Libya, managed to capture Benghazi. But then both offensives were stopped. Although the Germans did nothing in Russia until the spring, their African Corps launched a counteroffensive almost immediately. Our troops rolled all the way back to Gazala. We had wasted too many reserves in the last battles. I met several times with guys who fought in the Desert Air Force. They said things were going badly. We were in for grim days ahead. Of that they had no doubt. And then we had a whole series of misfortunes in the Far East. First, the American fleet was defeated at Pearl Harbor, then off the coast of Malaya. The Japanese sank the Ripples and Prince of Wales. The Japanese dominated the Pacific. Everything was going smoothly for them. They landed troops in the Philippines, the Dutch East Indies, the Badan Peninsula. The Allies fought desperately, especially the Dutch, but the enemy's superiority was too great. We slowly retreated along the entire front. And then came the black month of February. After the betrayal of Siam and the surrender of French Indochina, the Japanese launched an offensive in the Malay Peninsula. The huge fortress of Singapore, which was designed for defense only from the sea, surrendered on February 15. Many whites disappeared without a trace. It was the hardest blow Britain had received since Dunkirk. But it was not only a blow to Britain. The fall of Singapore was a blow to all nations fighting for freedom. The loss of prestige was total. And then there was a new blow within one week. After a year of constant bombardment, the battleships Scharnhorst and Nizana, accompanied by the cruiser Prinz Eugen, left their haven in Brest and made their way across the English Channel to their native German ports. Immediately, a wave of outrage swept across the country. The military was harshly criticized. First Bomber Command, then the Royal Navy and the government tried to justify themselves in the newspaper pages. They became, however, only the target of vicious caricatures. America, which had recently become our ally, was also perplexed. In Berlin, however, they trumpeted with fanfare. Speaking of these two misfortunes, I know too little about the first one. Only a few people came from the Far East, and they told horror stories of general apathy and lethargy. Of course, the day will come when we shall know the truth, but it will not be until after the war is over. But the escape of the Salmon and the Gluckstein is worth talking about. For an entire year, these ships were hit by our airplanes around the clock. Why aren't they destroyed or at least damaged? People on the street asked. The answer was simple. The pilots didn't see them. Not only the light of hundreds of searchlights, but also many false targets together with thousands of anti-aircraft gun shells turned the tiny patch of sky above the port into a real hell. Brest was simply impossible to bomb, let alone hit the ships. Even when our planes appeared during the day, the Germans immediately covered the entire neighborhood with thick yellow smoke, through which nothing could be seen. Our planes dropped bombs at random. Having determined on the neighboring island, they lay down on a combat course, after five minutes dropped bombs, and missed. However, the German battleship stood in the port for a year without going to sea. For the breakthrough, the Germans chose a day with exceptionally bad weather. In addition, an unfortunate set of circumstances prevented them from detecting their aircraft coastal command, which followed Brest, like a cat after a mouse hole. First spotted them Colonel Victor Beamish, who on his Spitfire made a reconnaissance flight off the coast of France. He immediately sent a radiogram, and with a grinding sound the rusty wheels began to spin. Bomber Command developed frantic activity. 
The Germans were attacked by torpedo boats, destroyers, and swordfish. All of them returned safely back, not counting six swordfish, under the command of Lieutenant Commander Eugene Esmond. They attempted to attack the Germans but were all shot down. Esmond was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. The Germans timed their breakthrough very skillfully. The lower limit of clouds was at an altitude of only 200 feet, and dozens of German fighters circled over the ships like a swarm of wasps. Then our bombers struck. Many of them found the enemy, some of them attacked him. However, low clouds forced to drop bombs from low altitude, and they just bounced off the armored decks. Forty-two planes did not return. It was beginning to look like the Germans had successfully broken through. They had already passed Den Helder and Hook Van Holland. But then Air Marshal Pierce stepped in. He gave the right order. The gunners, exhausted, hung magnetic mines from the planes. In the evening, a large minefield had been placed in the Germans' path to the ports of northern Germany. If they tried to bypass this barrier, they would run into another Royal Navy squadron. The Germans picked the mines, and this is what happened. Scharnhorst and Prince Eugen were damaged quite severely, but not dangerously. They blew up on one mine each. Thanks to the actions of barrage planes, these ships could not boast that they broke through without losses. But Nizanar received such damage that it was completely out of commission. The tugs managed to drag it to Kiel, where our bombers immediately put a heavy bomb into it, which made a large hole right above the forward artillery magazine. It had to be towed to the Polish port of Guinea, where it was decommissioned. This may serve as a fitting reply to those critics who blame Bomber Command. However, the fact remains. Two large ships managed to jump out of the trap under our very noses. It is now clear to everyone that the Axis powers have begun to realize their plan for world domination. Even a quick glance at the map showed that the war had become a world war. Japan was rapidly advancing westward. Germany had launched an offensive in Russia and North Africa during the summer. They were to meet somewhere in the Persian Gulf region. All of Europe had already been invaded, not counting Britain, which was under close siege. Then it would be the turn of South Africa, Australia, and other islands. Then a brief respite to build up forces, and the Axis armies would attack the New World from two sides, Japan from the Pacific, and Germany from the north through Canada. The whole world was to be under their boot. Great Britain was to be starved to death. The world was conquered. That's the prospect. Somewhere in the middle of the ocean, there's a point where the plane can't get back to base. You can only get to the target or die. I think in March 1942, the Allies were at that point. We had no choice, we had to win. Because they're Manchesters. They're just awful. The airplane itself is still all right. But the engines, when they work, everything goes fine. But they break down too often. We've had tons of accidents already. I've heard that the Manchesters aren't all right, but I didn't suspect it was that bad. At the end of the day, it's tolerable. If you get one engine hit, you'll get the same thing. Why can it fly on one motor? Why not? One guy in 61 Squadron managed to come back from Berlin on one engine, and he got the Distinguished Service Order for it. But that's an exception. And how many accidents did you have? I asked, suspecting that he had encountered problems himself, which was why he looked at the airplane with prejudice. You know, I've been lucky somehow, but I've seen a lot. Bill Wemond. Who's that? A guy from A-Level. He ran into a mine laying after a sortie, though it ended up being a good thing. I know, the commander told me about it. Emergency landing. Then you should have seen what happened to Lieutenant Colonel Balston, who managed to return after the afternoon raid on Brest. And what happened to him? He was pretty badly mauled by the anti-aircraft guns, and the weather was clearly not good. The rest of the guys had already landed when he approached the airfield. We saw that his ailerons were shot off. Anyway, he came in for a landing too high, about 100 feet higher than he should have. He gave throttle to go for a second approach, but the violent jerk caused his airplane to drop its tail 
and stand almost vertical. In this position, he gained an altitude of about 500 feet. Apparently, the airplane lost control. Then the airplane slowly, damned slow, lowered its nose and went vertically downward. It came down in the middle of the airfield, a hundred yards from the control tower where everyone was standing. I think his wife was there too. A fire. Of course, there was nothing left. It must have been terrible especially because he kept in touch to the last. Yes, it was. He probably could have parachuted out, but his gunner was badly wounded. While we were talking, the Lancaster appeared and engines roaring began its run-up. Now that's worth seeing. That's a real airplane, said Dunlop. Bob Allen stood at the window, and all three of us watched the airplane. The huge tail rose into the air. The engines howled just deafeningly, but the airplane did not get off the ground. Looks like there's going to be a crash, Bob reported calmly. I think you're right, I agreed. We had time to chat. There was no hurry. Very slowly, at least it seemed so, the huge bomber rolled across the airfield at 120 miles per hour. However, it never took to the air. Something had gone wrong. Then, ever so slowly, the airplane hooked the bomb bay with one wing and disappeared from view. A great cloud of dust rose, and a few seconds later there was a thud, as if it had crashed into something else. It's over, Bob said calmly. We waited for a column of black smoke to rise, but there was none. Then we walked back to the mess hall. Who was the pilot? One of the pilots asked. Tommy Boylan. Poor old Tommy. One of the navigators pressed the bell button, summoning the waiter, and everyone was silent for a while. Then Tommy walked in. His face was a little dirty, and his uniform appeared to be overstained with earth. His hair was a little disheveled, but otherwise there was no sign of the misfortune that had befallen him. He was born in Australia, and had just arrived in the squadron, having already completed his first combat cycle of sixty sorties. Tommy was a great guy, and without a second's hesitation, grabbed the first tray the waiter delivered with an iron hand. She saw the change that was happening to her husband. All wives feel that, and she understood what he was going through. After the garden gate in front of the dining room was closed, and the noise of the van faded into the distance, she would begin to wait. First the roar of the engines of the airplanes taking off, then the long hours of waiting each one turning into a veritable eternity. Suddenly time begins to fly at a terrible speed, and the woman begins to listen to the faintest sound. She knows that the weather is normal today, and the plane should return to their base. It can only be stopped by something terrible. Minutes turn into hours, and time stops altogether until the sound of a car rumbling again, the jingling of a gate, and he enters the room. Then she hugs him tightly, Sometimes she sinks involuntarily to her knees, realizing how stupid it is, and prays, prays to God not to let him fly anymore. The reason I'm telling you all this is because I was married myself. However, my wife worked in a military plant and just didn't know if I was in flight or not. This guy accomplished his mission and accomplished it well. The link commander went back and brought all his guys back. The night was clear. The full moon was shining. The squadrons attacked almost simultaneously, and all the bombs were dropped exactly on target. The whole raid took two hours, and in that time nearly 600 tons of bombs were dropped, which was close to a record. The destruction was very great, and the ancient city was burned to the ground. The next night the Germans bombed Exeter in retaliation, and we gave Harry Stauffer a farewell stag party on the eve of his wedding to Mary. It was a jolly party and almost no booze. I watched this guy as he joked and laughed, and thought he was a little young to be getting married after all. He had flung a few sorties and gained a little experience, and I hoped to God he would keep him alive. After all, Harry was so young and happy. The next day they were married, and all the boys congratulated the young couple. Quite a few jokes were made as they took the wedding trip in a sneezing old automobile. I think the bundle of tin cans tied to the car dragged behind them the whole way. 
and then I retired to my office. I had more than enough paperwork in those days. This was completely new to me. The fighter command doesn't have half of that waste paper, but my adjutant and I found a way out. We had a corporal in our formation who knew anything and everything. Bob Allen once remarked that he was the one who commanded the squadron on the ground. And yet one order from the commander caught my eye. It was signed personally by Marshal Harris and categorically forbade the wives of pilots to live closer than 40 miles to the base where the husband served. The only exception was for those who had lived there since peacetime. After a brief conference with the corporal, it turned out that there were only four of us. That was the most wonderful news I've heard in a long time. You can't fight and live a peaceful home life at the same time. That order was supposed to make life easier for the pilots, though not all of them realized it. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. It was terribly difficult to fly the Manchester after the Vaux. It seemed to me that it took hours to disperse, and the turns in the air this airplane made incredibly slow. However, it maintained controllability at 180 miles per hour, as Rob Ohm and I found out. He arrived at the squadron on the same day as me. Captain Robertson, born in New Zealand, was a great, always smiling guy. Moreover, he had already flown more than 30 sorties, and I immediately appointed him commander of the A Squadron with the temporary rank of major. Bill Womond became his deputy. We taught each other how to fly the Manchester, and I think the lessons were good for both of us. I taught him how to pilot as fighter planes do, and he showed me how to fly bombers. This assignment was welcomed, and Robbo shone as a commander both in the air and on the ground. After we had been in the squadron for a few days, we made our first trip together. It was fairly simple, but I had to exercise the utmost caution, as I had not encountered enemy anti-aircraft guns for a year. All we had to do was to place six mines at the entrance to Kiel Harbor. There were no anti-aircraft guns, there were no fighters there, so we returned without becoming more experienced by a single gram. Two nights later we went to visit Rostock. It was the third night of our air offensive. The operation plan called for a bomber group to attack the city and port, and Group 5 planes would bomb the factory that produced the Ni-111 bombers. This factory was located 10 miles from the city. We hoped that the workers, when they came to the factory the next morning, would find only ruins. On the first night, not a single anti-aircraft shell exploded over the factory. However, only 12 bombers struck, and therefore the destruction was not great. On the second night, the plant was attacked by about 60 bombers, but the Germans had already transferred there a significant number of anti-aircraft guns. Still, fires started at the factory and some of the workshops were destroyed. On the last night of the operation, it seemed to me that all the allocated bombers should attack the main shop. After the briefing, Hoppy and Bill came up to me. Why the devil didn't they send a large group of bombers against the plant? the first night when there were no anti-aircraft guns there. We would have done away with it at once. I don't know. It looks very silly, but I'll still ask the group headquarters. I replied. However, the group failed to answer that question as well. They only wanted to take pictures. But now all the planes were equipped with cameras, although they could not take good pictures from less than 4,000 feet. I didn't understand why the command insisted on taking pictures of the facility if to do so would require bombing from over 4,000 feet at the expense of marksmanship, when the order should have been given to bomb from low altitude, destroying the workshops, even if the pictures would turn out disgusting. Anyway, I ordered my guys to bomb from 2,000 feet, destroy the target, and to hell with the pictures. But we got orders the next night to finish the job. In the evening, I sat in the flight control center waiting for my planes to return. This center was very different from the fighter center. The only interesting things about it were the pretty girl behind the phone and the big blackboard on the wall. On the board were written out the names of the crew commanders involved in the raid that night. Against the names was written some other information, bomb load, time of departure, crew, and so on. But the most important was the last column above which the magic words landing time were written. I sat and listened to the plane's return, 
while at the same time enjoying looking at the girl who was climbing up the ladder to fill in that box. Mary Stoffer was very pretty. Time passed. One mark after another appeared. X-X-Ray sat at 5.20. Eye Yorker sat at 5.22. Finally, the whole board was filled in except for one box, S-Sugar. Usually it's very hard to sit and wait for the last cell to be filled. But today it was even harder than usual for me because the pilot of this airplane was Lieutenant Stoffer. I sat there smoking one cigarette after another until it finally dawned. A resident came in and pulled up the light cloaking curtains. I wanted to go to the carriage lounge to have a word with the boys, but I couldn't leave her alone. They sat silent, staring off into space. It was a fearful look. Then a ray of hope flickered as the phone rang. Surveillance reported that a solitary Manchester had crossed the shoreline and was heading towards us. Could it be Harry? A smile lit up her face. Mary couldn't speak. Her eyes glistened with tears she was trying to hold back. But then the spotter called again and said it was a 50-squadron airplane. Finally, I got up, took Mary's hand and led her to my car. She didn't cry, as she was a very courageous girl. Pardon the definition. She said she wanted to stop by the officer's dormitory to pick up some purchases she had made the day before. In her bag was a bag of cornflakes, a jar of marmalade, some butter and sugar, a slice of bacon, the simple familiar little things that hostesses buy. She clutched that bag tightly to her as I led her toward the house. As I drove back, I almost cried myself. Despite the success of the raids on Mornamund and Rostock, it was quite clear that spring would bring some changes in the Bomber Command's operations if we were serious about destroying targets. One not-so-great day in May, when the weather interfered with flying, a meeting was held to discuss only one question, how to put more bombs on the target. Vice Marshal Coritum presided. He had been sitting in the Air Ministry for many years, and now he had gotten his chance in the form of an appointment as commander of a bomber group. He was an intelligent, polite, and resourceful man who was very popular with the group's personnel. Coryton belonged to those commanders who strive to get into everything. He could climb into an airplane and start an argument with a surprised electrician over the electrical circuit diagram of the bomber, impressing him with his knowledge. To me and the other squadron commanders, he was the best group commander we had ever met. There is probably no second one like him. He looked at all the soldiers and officers of his group as if they were his own children and behaved like a loving father. On his little proctor, he regularly flew around all the airfields to personally make sure that everything was going well. The meeting began with him speaking. As you know, we have made some progress in the past few weeks. But all the targets attacked, to be honest, did not have serious air defense. I know that the raid on Warnemund cost us quite a bit of money, but I believe that the cause of that was due to air-to-air -air collisions. It seems to me that in order to hit small targets we should switch to daylight raids, such as the Augsburg raid. However, in this case we should completely forget about surprise and secrecy. Too many people will know about it. Another way is to improve the accuracy of night bombing. As you know, we are currently trying to do this then our losses will be minimized. And as a result, we will begin to gradually increase the strength of our strikes. He spoke at some length. First of all, he touched on the question of photography. All squadrons should seriously deal with this problem. To accomplish this, each squadron will be allocated several objects. The pictures will go to the group headquarters and from there to the headquarters of Bomber Command. As a result, by comparison it will be easy to identify the best squadron and the best crew. Moreover, a competition will be organized between the squadrons. The desire to surpass the rival will help to improve the shooting quality. Based on the results of the shooting, the best crews will be allocated to act as illuminators. They will receive flares. More often than not, the best squadrons will strike first, which is usually safer. There will be a practice bombing run, but not from 6,000 feet, but from 18,000 feet, which will be the closest approximation to combat conditions. We had never had anything like this at the plant before his arrival. He wanted to have a competition between squadrons. 
He added some more details and then invited questions. One by one, the squadron commanders gave their opinions. The group commander listened to them carefully, and then a long discussion began. The stenographer carefully recorded everything that was said so that it would be easier to remember all the arguments later. The question of choosing the route of the trek to the target came up again. Lieutenant Colonel Tudar of the 83rd Squadron said, All routes are chosen by Bomber Command staffers who haven't seen a single German anti-aircraft gun for six months, if not more. And you all know very well that the batteries do not stand still. The Germans move them from one point to another. In recent weeks, we haven't even seen the famous searchlight belt. They have spread them around the towns of the Ruhr, sending over 2,000 units there. The battle over the Ruhr has not yet begun, the group commander remarked. But I know, sir, that we won't be able to hit anything by the light of those damn bulls. I think they're even worse than the anti-aircraft guns, but I suppose it can be handled. Let the squadrons choose their own approach routes. After all, they're the ones who have to make the case. About an hour before the pre-flight briefing, I suggest we have a conference call to finalize the plan. Everyone will be able to make a suggestion. We'll choose a route to the target where we won't have to fly over areas of strong air defense. The bombing altitude will be chosen according to the number of anti-aircraft guns around the target. I figure that will make our guys' jobs a lot easier and we'll be able to put more bombs on target. Tudor sat up. Good idea, Coryton agreed. We'll try it out as soon as possible. But first we have to get the whole group into Lancasters. Until then, we can't do anything. What shall we call our meeting? Since it was about flight planning, we can call it the flight preparation meeting, suggested the chief of staff. Okay, the group commander nodded. There were cheers of approval, and he nodded to the stenographer. We discussed the many problems before us. First, training. The group is switching to large four-engine bombers. They looked nothing like the compact Hamptons. How would that work? First, each squadron would get a third unit, commanded by an experienced pilot resting after a cycle of sorties like Tommy Boylan. With three Lancasters, he should familiarize all pilots with the new machine. However, there remained a severe personnel problem. Men were needed to man the new links and where to get them. On the Hampton flew a crew of four people. The Lancaster needed seven men. Where to find them? And where to find experienced pilots? Where? It was necessary to reorganize the whole program of flight training, from the dusty offices of the Ministry of Aviation to the prairies of Canada. And there was only one reason for that, a radical restructuring of Bomber Command. We started receiving new navigational equipment, it allowed a pilot to determine his position in seconds and with unheard of accuracy, even if he was above the clouds. It was top secret, and now airplanes had to be guarded day and night, and that too required men. Where to get them? All branches of the army needed personnel. It was a kind of vicious circle. Then it was decided that training units were not the best way out of the situation. To form them diverted people who were already in short supply. Therefore, each link had to combine combat missions and retraining. But will it work? We already had a shortage of experienced flight engineers. We could recruit volunteers for mechanics, but it took time. We had to re-equip the airfields. The heavy Lancaster needed a longer landing strip. We faced hundreds of problems, and after four hours of meeting, I was finally stunned. On the way back, I saw the Lancaster flying. A couple of civilians didn't even look at it. They weren't interested in it. They didn't even realize what was going on. Rearming a bomber air group is a long and complicated business, but soon the entire bomber command will be rebuilt and rearmed. To tell the story of these labors in detail would require a thick book. It would be necessary to mention all those who worked hard for a long time to make this possible. Plants in the most difficult conditions mastered the production of new airplanes, Contractors were rebuilding airfields. Technical services were mastering new equipment. First of all, it was related to refueling systems. We can talk a lot about the hard work behind the short word rearmament. 
This activity is not as spectacular as combat sorties, but it also required hardy people. Oddly enough, the least affected were the pilots themselves. Over the next few days we received Lancasters. They arrived to us with crews of auxiliary transport aviation, almost ready for battle. Only minimal tweaks were required. In my own squadron, a retraining unit was never created. We had to master a new airplane on our own. Moreover, we were ordered to hurry up, because in two weeks we were to start intensive raids on German territory. During his leave Hoppy managed to visit another squadron, which was also retraining, and flew the Lancaster for ten hours. I asked him to show me what he had learned. The hardest part was getting used to the cockpit of a new airplane. In the cockpit of a modern airplane there are dozens of buttons, knobs, toggle switches. The pilot must firmly know where what is located, so that in flight to unmistakably find the right switch without looking at the control panel. All operations must be done automatically, just like driving a car. When piloting a heavy bomber on a dark night, the fraction of a second it takes a pilot to look from the windshield to the control panel can be the gulf between life and death. We climbed into the cockpit, and I noted that the arrangement of controls was much like that of the Manchester. Almost everything appeared to be in familiar places. The only differences were the four throttle sectors and a couple or two other little things. Hoppy sat in the pilot's seat. I got behind him. Dave Shannon, who had only recently joined the squadron, sat next to Hoppy in the co-pilot's seat to act as flight engineer. Hoppy explained in detail the procedure for takeoff. Toggle switches off, he commanded into the microphone. Toggle switches off, Dave confirmed. Connect the internal tanks. Internal tanks connected. Start the pumps. Done. Okay. Now reading out the inspection order, Hoppy said. I listened in silence as Dave read out the list, which turned out to be very long. Check the tie-down straps, Dave said. Done. Brakes and air system pressure. Okay, brakes and air system. Landing gear struts locked in place. Hoppy obediently answered one question after another until the list ran out. Then Dave moved on to interviewing the crew. Everyone from the bombardier to the tail gunner had to check their equipment. This took quite a while. When the check was over, Hoppy turned to me. Of course, this is a complete drill. While it should be mandatory during the first flights, this procedure can be shortened later. Some things will be done quite automatically. But the next stage, starting the engines, taking off and the flight check, never changes. Most pilots will perform it, however experienced they may be. Then he turned to the flight engineer. Prepare for launch. Oh, okay, ready for launch. The mechanics prepared the starters and Hoppy put his hand on the throttle sectors. Dave had to turn on the ignition. Contact right outer, shouted Hoppy through the cockpit window. Dave pressed the buttons one by one, and the four huge motors came to life. The air was filled with the rattling rumble characteristic of Merlin motors. Remove the pads. Pads removed. When I looked out the window, I saw a small man scurrying between the landing gear struts twenty feet below me. In his hands he was holding a cable to which brake pads were tied. These pads were supposed to keep the airplane from shifting when the engines were started. Although airplanes had grown in size considerably since the last war, the pads remained the same. It was what connected us to the ground. A man lay on his back under a huge propeller cutting the air four feet above him. Then another mechanic appeared ahead and raised clenched fists above his head. Hoppy released the brakes. A whoosh of air was heard, and the airplane rolled gently down the taxiway. On reaching the runway, Hoppy stopped and alternately ran the engines at full power, each time checking the supercharger system, the variable pitch propellers, and the magneto. Meanwhile, Dave called up the control tower. Hello, Control. This is Yo calling. Authorize takeoff. Okay. Permission to take off. Keep in touch, a female voice replied. It was someone from the female auxiliary of the KVVS. They had already started doing the men's jobs to unleash the men we needed. The women were doing a great job. A new series of hoppy commands followed. 
Flaps 30. Close radiators. Lock throttle. Prepare for takeoff. Tail gunner is the rear clear. Clear astern, came the reply. Hoppy gave all engines full throttle, then released the brakes. The acceleration was terrible, and I grabbed the armored back of the pilot's seat to keep from flying backwards. Full throttle. Full throttle, Dave confirmed. Soon the speed indicator showed 110 miles per hour, and the airplane suddenly stopped shaking. We were airborne. Gaining altitude. Gaining altitude. Landing gear down. Landing gear retracted. Flaps retracted. Flaps retracted. Cruising mode. As Dave set the engines to the proper orgum to enter cruising mode, I noted that our speed was 120 miles per hour. Quite a lot for a heavy bomber. The airplane flew steadily and responded obediently to the helm. The Lancaster was as easy to fly as it could be for its size. It wasn't a car, it was a piece of candy. Hoppy showed me how to stop the motor with a simple push of a button, and how to fly with only one motor, gradually losing altitude. But the airplane, even in this mode, could stay in the air long enough to get away from an enemy bank. He also showed how to land the airplane on its belly using the flaps. We used a smooth cloud at 4,000 feet as the sea surface. After half an hour, Hoppy showed me everything, after which he called the control tower and requested a landing. Now watch carefully, he said. Mastering the correct landing action is extremely important. We went down in circles until we were about a mile from the runway, at an altitude of about 1,000 feet. Then a new series of commands followed. Flaps 20. Dave obediently set the flaps to 20 degrees. Speed dropped to 160 miles per hour. Increase RPM. The sectors went forward, and the engines roared, throwing up clouds of white smoke. Release landing gear. Landing gear released. We were entering the runway. Radiators closed. Radiators closed. Two green lights lit up in front of the pilot. Landing gear locked, Dave reported when he saw it. We were now heading straight for the landing strip, which to me seemed no wider than a man's height. Flaps down. Flaps down. Dave pushed the handle, and the airplane immediately threw its nose up while Hoppy used the altitude rudders to try to hold it down. Speed. Speed 130 to 125, 128 to 130, Dave said as we approached the ground. You have to keep the nose of the airplane up when you land. Hoppy tossed over his shoulder. Then he asked. Speed and altitude. 300, 120. 200, 120. 100, 105. 50, 105. Okay, Hoppy barked. Get off the gas. Dave tore back all four sectors while Hoppy pulled the wheel with both hands. The landing went splendidly with the crackle and sneeze of the exhaust. We ran down the runway for about 100 yards and came to a stop. Then Hoppy pulled the oxygen mask off his sweating face and said, That's it. Now try it for yourself. For the next few days, we did training flights with my crew. I had only three permanent crew members. The others had to be borrowed, hired or stolen from other pilots whenever possible. Boy Ruskell was the navigator. He was very young, as his nickname suggested. However, he turned out to be an excellent navigator and was perfectly capable of handling tricky electrical devices. The boy's only weakness turned out to be beer. He could drink a pint, after which his behavior became quite comical. If we went on leave together, say, to Boston, he usually drank lemonade. Sometimes he'd get a lemonade stiff. Johnny Shooter was older. He was a completely unscrupulous man, as far as I know. Hutch was a radio operator, and he'd just been drafted. I should mention one other man who flew with us. He was a radio operator, but he could do absolutely everything in the air, except he couldn't land an airplane. Everyone called him Geordie and loved him very much. He was a real cockney and wanted to fly as often as possible. Somehow he managed to make seven sorties with different crews. First he flew as a gunner, then as a flight mechanic and finally as a radio operator. 
It was funny to see Jordy before the flight. His attire was hideous and indescribable. But on his head, he invariably wore a silk beret like those worn by French sailors. He had sworn not to take to the air without that beret. And he kept his bow. After all, we were more or less prepared. After that, we were sent to a certain airfield in Cambridgeshire to pick up the air minister, Sir Archibald Sinclair, and a couple of golden pheasants. We were proud of our mission. However, it so happened that our flight engineer was a rookie. On the way back, the minister poked me in the back with his finger and asked me to turn off one engine. I did so, and the minister was very pleased. Then he asked me to turn off the second one, which pleased him even more. After we had been flying on two motors for a few minutes, one of the generals appeared in the cockpit and asked me to start the motors back up, because, unlike the minister, the golden pheasants were in a hurry. And then, to my horror and the horror of everyone else, the last two engines came on. My flight engineer had inexperiencedly pushed the wrong buttons. However, all was well, as after a couple of seconds he managed to start all four engines. However, during those seconds I had time to imagine in colors and colors what kind of trouble we would get into if we had to go into an emergency right in the middle of England, and the only reason for that would be human stupidity and with the Minister of Aviation on board. But at this time, he was trying out the tail turret and didn't notice anything. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The two weeks that the air group commander had given us had come to an end. During this time, thanks to Hopi, Bill, and a few other pilots, the whole squadron had learned to fly the Lancasters day and night. A group of new flight engineers had arrived, and we now had at least 40 crews ready to fly. On May 29 we received orders to prepare. A major raid on Hamburg was planned, in which aircraft of all types were to take part, including those from the coast and training commands. In total, the raid was to involve about 1,300 aircraft, which were to drop 1,500 tons of bombs. This raid was to be the largest in the history of air warfare. However, the weather saved Hamburg. The raid was postponed to the next night, and Cologne was chosen as the target. Luck favored the bombers during this raid, and they did an excellent job. By the end of the raid, the anti-aircraft batteries had been suppressed, and the city was a sea of fire. Within 90 minutes, nearly 1,500 tons of bombs had been dropped on Cologne. Air Vice Marshal Baldwin, who was on one of the bombers, said he had not seen anything like it. 38 planes of our squadron participated in the raid, dropping 88 tons of bombs without losing a single machine. This was a record, and in the combat diary of the squadron appeared a corresponding entry. The plan of operation was to destroy the industrial areas of Cologne and a little pacify the exhausted British people. The success of the raid was explained by the fact that this night was a full moon and the sky was completely clear. Visibility was excellent. The next night, a compound of almost 1,000 bombers tried to do the same in Essen, but it turned out quite the opposite. More precisely, nothing worked. All the way our bombers had to fly in the clouds, and the bombs were scattered all over the Ruhr Valley. Nevertheless, those Germans whose homes were in the countryside had a hard time. The next raid of 1,000 bombers was the last. Its target was Bremen, but this raid failed due to bad weather. These raids were then discontinued because the training squadrons were completely disrupted. It also had to be taken into account that we risked losing the most experienced instructors, although the percentage of bombs accounted for by the training command aircraft was small. From then on, we had to raid as often as possible, with between 400 and 600 bombers involved in the operations. I flew less than my guys, but still made sorties at least once every five days. None of the squadron commanders refused to fly sorties. We had to make countless papers, write funerals, deal with the current affairs of the squadron, but on top of that we had to fly at night. In fact, every time the guys went on a flight, we sat in the control center waiting for their return. However, the commander could not sleep the next day. After three hours in bed, he had to get up and start preparing for the next raid distributing bombs and fuel, manning the crews. 
but this was also done by many other people at each base. The armament service, the navigational service, intelligence, they all did their job, all terribly tired, but trying to deliver as many bombs to Germany as possible. Few people outside our world understood what lay behind the dry line of a military bulletin. Last night, a strong formation of bombers made a raid for the first time in the last week, and that meant a lot of hard work at all the bases. Every day the crews were briefed, the bombs were loaded into the planes, they prepared for takeoff. Sometimes squadrons were already taxiing to the runways when the red light on the signal tower announced that the flight was cancelled. And imagine the pilot's feelings at that moment. Most pilots will agree with me when I say that the hardest part of a bomber raid is, is the takeoff. Personally, I hate those minutes when you have to sit in the lounge and wait for the car to take you to the airplane. Those are horrible minutes. You feel like your guts are just sticking to your spine. Your legs refuse to hold you up. You laugh loudly and nervously in response to stupid jokes. You light one cigarette after another and throw them away after the first puff. Sometimes you feel completely wrecked and would really like to go to the hospital. The smallest incident makes you furious and you flare up at the slightest occasion and without it. When someone forgets their parachute, you call them names that normally wouldn't even cross your mind. And it's all because you're afraid, deathly afraid. I know because I've experienced it myself. I always feel disgusted until the airplane hatch slams shut, until the radio operator says, enter come on, and the engines come to life. And then you instantly calm down. The work begins. When the flight's canceled, the compressed spring unravels with terrible force. Someone laughs wildly. Somebody gets wet as a mouse. Someone gets drunk as hell. They're out of luck. It was me and Tommy Lloyd talking about something. He was a senior intelligence officer. He'd been called back into the army at the start of the war. He had fought in the last war and had been awarded the Distinguished Service Order. We were sitting in a small club in Skegness, sipping beer with the lads. We were all bloody tired, as we had been on constant alert for the last 14 days, but we had only flown four sorties in that time. SPAC who had just piled into the bar, let loose an unflattering remark about vacationing pilots. Somebody's at war in Egypt, aren't they? I almost went ballistic. That's right. They just don't get it, Tommy said. Yeah, they don't understand. If they had to sleep three hours a night, there'd be a terrible uproar. Their union would be up in arms. However, I suppose the infantry guys had an even harder time in that war. That's the order of the day. However, no one knows what goes on at the bomber airbases. That should have been told. Someone should tell. Hopefully, the day will come when it will be found out. I agreed. About the parties. There weren't too many at the time. We were very busy. Once we had something at the dance hall in Boston, but it had nothing to do with the festivities of the recent past. The only incident worth mentioning was when Bill Womond lent his tunic to a road labber. The fellow was going to a dance, and I thought one of my new officers had arrived. I ordered him to go shave. Imagine his amazement and bewilderment. At this time, rumors were circulating that our group would be transferred to the Middle East. Things had been going from bad to worse there in recent months, and these rumors seemed pretty valid. However, this did not happen. Nevertheless, aviation was needed on all fronts. After the heaviest fighting at Knightsbridge, when a large number of our tanks were destroyed, our troops retreated to El Alamein, the last barrier before Cairo. It seemed that we did not have too much chance of holding this position. It is said that Mussolini personally arrived in Africa, taking with him a luxurious ceremonial uniform to enter Cairo on a white horse. However, Fresh reinforcements were moved under El Alamein. Our troops showed miracles of heroism and stopped Rommel. The German-African Corps began to run out of steam as its communications had already stretched for 1,500 miles. In Russia, the Germans continued to advance. They were advancing toward the dawn. At an alarming rate, it was beginning to look like the end was near. 
Submarine warfare in the Atlantic was nearly cutting off our communications with America. We simply had no way to repel night submarine attacks. My squadron had to send three Lancasters to Ireland to hunt for submarines, but this weakened our strikes on Germany itself. So serious was the submarine threat at that time. It was only in the Far East that the aggressor's advance was slowed. This was done thanks to the foresight of American admirals. Battles in the Coral Sea and at Midway they held a completely new way. In both cases, a large number of aircraft carrier aircraft were used, which brought decisive victories. The Japanese advance toward Australia was halted. Might they now try to break through to India? Only time could answer such questions. However, our people and parliamentarians were tired of waiting for good news. Churchill came under fierce attack in Parliament for his war strategy. But he had to endure it all, because major joint Allied operations were scheduled for the fall, and for reasons of secrecy they could not be mentioned. Time passed, new crews came and went, and the only offensive operations of the entire British armed forces were conducted by a few bomber squadrons. The raids on Hamburg and Dusseldorf, conducted on moonlit nights, brought only partial success. Decent bombing accuracy was achieved only because the planes were going quite low and the crews could see the aiming point. But the same bright moon dramatically increased the danger. The number of German night fighters increased every day. Soon they became a serious threat, even more serious than anti-aircraft guns. To defend against them, we had to fly in close formation, but it interfered with the approach to the point of dropping bombs. One night Hoppy and I almost collided over the Hamburg docks when we tried to attack the same target at the same time. But that only happened on moonlit nights. Raids in the dark proved almost useless, but very dangerous. The pilots circled for long periods of time trying to locate the city, risking collision every minute. Sometimes as many as 400 airplanes were over the target at the same time. When we were in England, we thought that 20 airplanes circling over the base was already too many and dangerous. And what happened in the sky over Bremen, when there were several hundred bombers? But almost always the pilots had to put up with the danger of staying too long over the target. In the daytime, it is very easy to see where you intend to drop your bombs. You can take the shortest route to the target by flying in a straight line. This is the safest method of attack. At night, however, you have to dash up and down trying to distinguish what you've been ordered to attack. To avoid collisions, the planes are forced to diverge, the formation breaks down, and now they can become easy prey for night fighters. Something had to be done. We needed new tactics. We could deliver heavy bombs to the target. 4,000 and 8,000 pounders were expected to arrive very soon. A lot of incendiary bombs could be dropped in a series a mile long. We had the guns, we had airplanes, we had crews who could bomb aptly with the new sights. Now we had to get a concerted effort to put as many bombs as possible in one spot. That was the only thing that could make a real difference. But how? First of all, the best crews of the best squadrons had to carry flares. They were packed in cassettes of twelve, and after launching they lit up the surroundings well, but only for a few minutes. At times, however, these rockets did more harm than good. Due to navigational errors, some of the illuminating planes could fire them over the wrong city. Clouds could reflect their light and expose the bombers to night fighters. Some targets, like the Krupp factories at Essen, were surrounded by so many anti-aircraft guns and searchlights that even the light of the rockets was lost in the glare. One day we started practicing daylight flights at high altitude. Immediately, the rumors started. We're going to hunt the Tirpitz again. No, we'll bomb French airfields to stop the Badiker raids. But I had a hunch of my own. I was talking to Tommy Lloyd. Hoppy was also here. What are we putting on this high-rise circus for? I'm not quite sure, but I can guess something. Krupp. Yes. I think so too, I agreed. The Americans have already begun raids on their fortresses, they're being covered by fighters. I wouldn't be surprised if our command asked permission to fly with them under the protection of their machine guns. That would be nice, Hoppy said. Why don't we have machine guns like that? 
We don't need them at night. The range is too short, but it would be nice to have stronger armament. Bill, who had just come up, interjected. Okay, so how are we going to bomb these well-defended targets? I asked. And I don't see how we can bomb these factories at all, whether it's day or night. They are too well covered by anti-aircraft guns. I don't know either, I added. But Tommy Lloyd had an idea. I can guess that a special squadron of bowfighters or mosquitoes with select crews will be formed. They will have to appear at dusk, just before the main force arrives, and will drop colored lighters on the plant itself. They'll be visible from a high altitude, and our guys will be able to bomb the target in peace. Looks good, but there will be high casualties in the suicide squadron. I guess so, but the target will be destroyed. Yeah, and that's the most important thing, Hoppy added. It was lunchtime. I had already gotten up to leave. But then the phone rang. Tommy picked it up. This is group headquarters, he calmly announced. We waited, wondering what was wrong. We were due to go on leave this evening, and there was a small party planned. All right, said Tommy gloomily. I'll tell the squadron commander. He looked at us, squinting. You were quite right. Our squadron is bombing the Krupp factories today. We should take off as soon as possible. What the devil? I exploded. Oh, don't be afraid. It's only a raid above the clouds. We took off, six airplanes, one after another. By 3 a.m. we were back. On June 8, I took Dave Shannon with me as co-pilot, and we flew toward Wilhelmshaven. The wind was strong, which the meteorologists did not expect. When we were still 60 miles from our target, the flares had already started to go out. We immediately rushed there, but saw only empty space. Then more flares erupted to the north. Nothing again. In desperation we looked around, trying to see an illuminated target, but all in vain. Finally, we turned north, found the shoreline, walked along it, and found the harbor. There was nothing there, even though the attack should have started twenty minutes ago. Even Dave wasn't sure we had come out at the required location. The pictures taken during this operation disappointed everyone. Bombs were scattered all over northwest Germany. But worst of all, we suffered heavy casualties because we acted in a scattered manner. The German news agency reported, last night enemy planes dropped several bombs on northwestern Germany. There were no casualties or damage. From 106 Squadron, Lieutenant Broderick did not return. I went to see his wife, having waited a full three hours after the deadline for return. Already approaching the gate, I noticed a small white face in the window. She opened the door before I could even ring the bell. She knew what had happened. I could read it in her eyes. She listened to me in silence, even though her whole world was crumbling at that moment. Then she turned without a word and started up the stairs. And when I returned to my room, I was not thinking of that agonizing scene. I was thinking about the leadership of Bomber Command, sending us out on raids like this. These guys, like hundreds of others, didn't make it back, but I'm not sure they even saw the target. That had to change. A new tactic was created that slightly resembled the one proposed by Tommy Lloyd. Maybe it was even better. 